If you will, take your Bible this morning. I ask you to turn to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 today, and we're going to read verse 29 together and have a word of prayer today and ask the Lord to bless our study. Colossians chapter 1, and let's look at verse 29. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 29. Just by way of reminder today, as you're finding your spot there, you're welcome to follow along and fill in a few blanks if you would like. On the back of your bulletin is a brief overview of our outline, and I trust that uh, that's a help to some of you today as uh, you follow the Lord's leading and teaching in His Word. Colossians chapter 1, verse 29, Paul says this, Whereunto I also labor, striving according to His working, which worketh in me mightily. And today we want to conclude our series. We've been looking at this term Christian, what it means to be a real Christian. And today we want to look at the last of our study, which is this, getting real with effort. Let's pray and let's ask God to help us today as we study His Word. Father, thank You for the joy it is to be in this setting today. Thank You for allowing us to gather with one another in Your presence. God, to be reminded of Your grace and Your will for our lives. And Lord, thank You for sustaining us through this last week and Your provision, Your protection, and Lord, Your intervention in our lives. We're so grateful for it. And Father, as we gather now to study Your Word, we pray that You would meet with us, You would speak to us through Your Word. God, help me today to articulate only that which You would have said. Guard my lips, guard my mouth. Lord, may it be acceptable in Your sight what is uttered today. It may be biblical, may be spirit-filled, Pray for those that are listening today, God, that there's much that could distract them, much that could keep them, Lord, from receiving your truth today. I pray you would guard uh, their heart and their attention, and that, Lord, may each of us leave today more in tune with you and more surrendered to your will for our lives. Bless our study, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I don't know, any of you struggle with laziness like I do? Any of you have that, especially the dog days of summer when it's, where it feels almost too hot to even breathe? You know, that, that's been, we've had a few days recently like that. I guess we got spoiled with all the mild weather we've had this summer. But I read the other day a list of rules that are rules for the lazy, all right? These are rules that those of us that struggle with apathy and laid back approach to life that we live by and uh, many of us probably practiced these and didn't even realize their rules. Here are just a few today. Number one, lazy rule number one, if you drop the ice cube, just kick it under the fridge. Have you ever done that? Be honest today, all right? Just, just kick, when no one's looking, just kick that puppy as far back under the fridge as you can, all right? Uh, number two, if it's not on the first page of Google, it does not exist. If you can't find it on Google, it, it ceases to be something you even search for. And then number three, which I find very humorous in my own life, if, especially when you're sitting down, if it is more than five feet away, it becomes absolutely unnecessary. <laughs> you ever tried to reach for something without getting up, you know, and if you can't reach it with your extra stick you've got sitting next to your chair, it, 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 you don't need it to survive, you don't need it to thrive. If you're like me, you struggle uh, with putting in the effort that is necessary to be what God would have us to be. And I asked this question this morning as we begin in all seriousness, what is the one characteristic that if we were to compare a first century believer with a 21st century believer, what would be one of the main differences between those two people? Us being at the 21st century postmodern culture, all that we deal with in our church age today, and those who were a part of the early churches, what's one quality that I think maybe is different in those early days than from today? And I believe, yes, that's true, I believe that primarily the main characteristic would be this. You have to kill me to stop me from being and doing what God has led me to do and be. There is a lack of commitment in our day. And when I say that, I, I include me in the we as far as we lack effort. We lack commitment. We're going to talk about what God does in a moment. And trust me, it is by grace through faith. We're not talking about salvation. We're not talking about even our merit in God's sight. But I'm talking experiencing the full dynamics of the Christian life. I believe often is a lack of effort that greatly undermines our relationship with Christ. Winston Churchill was once quoted as saying this, continuous effort, not strength or intelligence, 
is the key to unlocking our potential. And many of us were waiting for something to happen when we are the ones who need to be happening. We need to be doing some things. We need to be exerting ourselves in the instruction that God gives. So the question today is how do we become more like Christ in the area of effort? And today what I want to do here in verse 29 as well as a few verses that preceded in Colossians chapter 1, we want to look at two types of effort that ought to be true of every believer, every Christian uh, that is exerted upon the life and through the life of the believer. The first one is this. Number one, first of all, you and I need to exert our personal effort. Look at the beginning of verse 29. Paul says this, whereunto also I, or whereunto I also labor striving. And so number one, first of all, there needs to be personal effort. There was a study done a few years ago, and it was a study comparing the mindset of mothers in Japan, and for some reason I don't know why they picked it, and mothers from the state of Minnesota here in the United States. And they asked these mothers, they asked them one question, and it was amazing the difference in the response of those mothers that had children in Japan and those mothers who had children in the state of Minnesota. The question was this. They were asked to rank the most important things that a child needs to succeed academically. That was the premise of this study. And the answers ranged from several different things, but at the top of the list were the following two answers. For the mothers in uh, in, uh, Minnesota, the response was ability that that was the number one most important thing a child needed to succeed academically. The mothers in Japan, at the top of their list, had the following word, effort. Effort. And I would submit to you today, many of us are waiting for ability. We're waiting for some divine opportunity when really where we need to start is what are we doing with what God has already given to us? Is there effort today? Is there exerting of our own personal effort in our relationship with Christ? If you were to read through the Bible, I'd encourage you to do it sometime. Look for verses where there is, at the beginning of the verse, this following little word, if, and then whatever follows that, and then in the same verse or same passage, a then, with a promise that follows the then. If you will do this, God says, then I will do this. There are certain things where there are prerequisites. God's still going to do the lion's share of the work, but he says, you have to first do or be or say something, as a result of that effort, I will bless that and I will provide what I have promised. I think we lack in our day the if and then flow of spiritual discipline. What could God do if we got our if in order today? Then God could meet, then God could work, then God could bless, then God could deliver. So I would ask you this morning, what are some ifs that if we will do them, then God will provide His power and His work will begin? Well, three of them I give you today. First of all, number one, I believe we need to exert, it, exert effort in the area of compassion in ministry, having a compassionate ministry. Look, if you will, earlier in this chapter, beginning in verse 25, and we're just going to bounce back and forth a couple of verses here in the beginning or the middle of this chapter. Look, if you will, first at verse 25. Paul earlier says this, notice verse 25 of Colossians 1, wherefore I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you. Ministry. Paul in another place in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 12, which is, by the way, my, the verse that I would quote if someone asked me, how did God lead you into ministry? What was the verse? What was the, the challenge? It would be this verse, 1 Timothy 1, 12. Paul says, and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for the account of me faithful, putting me into the ministry. He was grateful for it. God had put him into a place of ministry. Uh, Brother Steve's here today. Uh, We have this running joke, and if you're offended by this statement, you can pick on him afterwards, but he refers to his hairdo as a follicle cul-de-sac. And I think it's a great way to describe his hairdo, all right? By the way, those of you laughing, some of you have that same style going on. Whether you chose that or not, that's what you've got going, a follicle cul-de-sac. Now you're all looking at his head, all right? I embarrassed him thoroughly. He'll get me back. I know that. Uh, I read the other day an article, an author was saying this, God has not created us to be cul-de-sac Christians where God blesses and God works and it just ends with us. And we just sit on it and we just park on it and we just enjoy it and bask in the glory of it. It is to benefit others. We're a channel, not a cul-de-sac. 
And a real Christian sees what God blesses and how God provides is not just for us, but for them, for those that have yet to receive what God can bring into a life. And there's nothing that will grow your faith like giving what God has given to you. Because then you go back for more and God just processes and, and fills again and renews again and then you go out and bless and encourage someone else again and again and again. And I've found that when I do ministry, my Christian faith becomes more alive, it becomes more exciting, it becomes more dynamic. And if today your Christianity is less than that, can I encourage you to start with ministry? Do something for someone that God has laid upon your heart. In Mark chapter 10 and verse 45, it describes Christ as the Son of Man who came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give His life a ransom for many. And if Christ was not too good for ministry, I would submit to you, neither are you, neither am I. God calls us to a place of compassionate ministry. There was a story I was reading the other day of a Roman aqueduct that went through Segovia, uh, a province in Spain. This aqueduct, I don't know if you're familiar with them, but it would basically, it was elevated, uh, exposed plumbing where it was just kind of a channel that would transport water. And often it was uh, significantly off the ground to compensate for the dips and uh, hills in that region. This uh, aqueduct was built in uh, 109 AD, all right? So 109 AD is when it was built. For 1,800 years, it carried cool water from the mountains to the hot and thirsty city that was at the bottom of those mountains. 60 generations of men drank their water from uh, what came from that aqueduct. As the centuries went by, uh, going into the early 19th century, they began to think about this as a landmark. This is a, something of great value and significance. And so a new generation decided that they would idle this aqueduct to preserve it. They didn't want to keep running water over, they wanted to protect it, and it would be a monument of the architecture and engineering in that region. So they ran modern pipes, they gave the ancient brick and mortars a reverent rest, and immediately that aqueduct began to fall apart. And what for 18 centuries, labor and ministry and service could not destroy, idleness quickly began to corrupt. And here's the challenge I give you this morning. If you're, listen to me, if your version of Christianity is not benefiting someone else, it is not Christianity. Right. See, we, we sit on it, we store it, we often, let's be honest today, we hoard what comes to us as a believer. And I would submit to you, until what we have as a Christian is blessing and ministering to someone else, it's not what it should be. Can I ask you this past week, has your Christianity benefited someone? What's their name? What did it do in their life? God wants to work in us but so that He can work through us. May God help us not to be a cul-de-sac Christian, but to be a conduit, an aqueduct, bringing God's grace and blessing to others. That's Christianity. Now, if you will, number two, look, if you will, back at our text at verse 25. There's a second effort that we must make. First of all, God, I want to be a Christian by being compassionate in ministry. Notice that verse 25. He says this at the end of the verse, after talking about being a minister, he says, notice, to fulfill, notice these next four words, the Word of God. Number two, secondly, we need to uh, communicate the Scriptures. We need to be involved in the communication of Scripture. There was a story in the news yesterday of a man, 22-year-old Arizona man, who was, was uh, trying to make a statement And what he did is he took a Bible, walked to a Christian uh, ministry, it wasn't a church, but like an outreach in a section of his town there in Arizona, lit the Bible on fire, and urinated on it. Now when I hear that, if I had lived within driving distance of where that went down, I probably would have been there and had a few things to say or do if I had seen that happen. Do you know how much attack is being made against the Word of God today? Does that concern you like it does me? Now, we may not see what was just described in that story this morning, but we have blatant or at least subtle attacks being made against the Word of God. But do you know that's not our worst enemy when it comes to our relationship with the Word of God? It's not. It's not the direct, violent, vulgar attacks against the Word of God. You don't want to know what it is? It's the apathy of God's people toward the Word of God. 
The outright attacks, when has there been a day in church history where the Word of God has not been attacked? Let's go back, let's start with the Garden of Eden. Yea, hath God said. The Word of God has always been under attack. But it's us as God's people, those who claim to be Christians. What's our attitude about the Word of God? Are we willing to hear it? Are we willing to share it? Is there a joy in our heart? Is there a smile upon our face as we hear God's Word? And this morning, you and I must be challenged to love the Word of God, to desire the Word of God, and to listen to it whenever the opportunity is given. Now, I want you to look at a quick verse. You're there in Colossians 1. Hold your place there. Would you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3? And I want to give you an example of a church that was off in this area. May God caution us today. Not that we're judging this church necessarily. We're just learning from their example and asking God to protect us today in this area of our relationship with the Word of God. 1 Corinthians, if you would, chapter 3 and verse number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 1. Now, if I were to ask you, I don't know if you've seen, the word Corinthian is not necessarily a good description of a church. You know, I haven't heard of too many churches called the 1 Corinthian church or the 2 Corinthian church. The Corinthian church had a lot of baggage, a lot of uh, bad reputation. And if I were to ask you today, what was the root cause of all of their issues? Why was the Corinthian church, why did it have the issues it had? We might list all kinds of things. You know, they had carnality, they had disagreement, they had pride. But I think we find here in chapter 3 the root of the issues in the church. Look at it. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, notice, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you are not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. For you are carnal, for whereas there are among you envyings, and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal? Notice this, and walk as men. The root cause of the issues in the church at Corinth was a lack of alliance, of allegiance, and of attention to the Word of God. They were doing their own thing, and the Word of God was not dwelling richly in their hearts. It was not the source of their growth and progress. A.W. Tozer was once quoted as saying this, you may talk about power, but if you neglect the one book God has given you as the one instrument through whom He imparts and exercises His power, you will not have it. And if you ever have power, you will not maintain it except by daily, earnest, intense study of the book. And he ends with this, 99 Christians in every 100 are merely playing at Bible study. And therefore, 99 Christians in every 100 are mere weaklings when they might be giants, both in their Christian life and in their service. So may we dwell more upon the Word of God and let it dwell in us in a richer fashion. This past uh, two weeks, I've been working on some seminary studies, and my wife, thankfully, I guess it's good to have an English major as your wife. She corrects my grammar all the time, and I need that. Um, But she also will uh, edit my papers. And my dear wife, over the last two weeks, has edited 65 or so pages of writing that I have done, which has taken her hours to do. When I write, it just, you can assume. My wife assumes. She doesn't ask, do you think maybe you need me to look over that paper? She knows that she needs to look over my papers. When I write, there's just error, just that exudes from me. Uh, That's just a part of me and many of us in the room. Our words, our communication. But may I remind you, that's not true of the Word of God. It's perfect. It's it's infallible and it, it demands and it requires and it should draw our attention to it. One other verse I would give you, let's contrast from a poor example with the church at Corinth. Go now, if you will, to 1 Thessalonians, the model church. And notice, I believe, what is the main difference between the church at Corinth, which was a poor example of what a church should be, and the church, (laughs) excuse me, the church at Thessalonica, which was an excellent example. 1 Thessalonians, if you will, all the T's are together if you're still flipping, as I am. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2 and verse 13. And notice the contrast between the spirit of the church at Corinth and the spirit of the church at Thessalonica, specifically as they heard the word of God. Verse 13 of chapter 2 of 1 Thessalonians, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, notice, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe." Is that our posture? Is that our attitude as we receive the Word of God? I hope as you hear me today, my prayer is always 
I mean, I hope, I hope we get along. I hope we have a good relationship, you and I. But I hope when you come here, you hear from God. I've had people, well, Pastor, you spoke to me today. And I appreciate you saying that. Maybe God used me, but God's trying to have a conversation with you today. And if I'll get out of the way and you'll stay out of the way, the Word of God is what's being communicated. That, that ought to excite us. That ought to move us. That ought to challenge us in our areas of growth. And so a Christian wants to hear from God and therefore turns to the Word of God to receive that. Now, I will tell you this morning, I believe many of us in this room, starting with me, we undervalue the Word of God. Um, Some of you have not been in the Bible this week. You haven't read it, haven't even opened it since last Sunday. And I love you enough to tell you that should not be true of a Christian. We ought to love this book. We ought to open this book, and we ought to allow it to open us up and to work in our hearts and in our minds. I see often an inability of us to share it. We don't even, we're not even sure how to share the plan of salvation with an unbeliever. We ought to be familiar with that. We ought to be frequently sharing that with others. And often in corporate settings where the Word of God is open, if we're not careful, the glazed look comes over us when God is trying to speak to us. And to be a Christian, the Word of God needs to be something we hear often. When you're faithful to the times and places where God's Word is taught and preached, I believe you're being like Jesus. That's what Christian's all about, right? And when the Word of God is open, we ought to be there. We ought to be listening and learning from it in a way that pleases Him. All right, now if you will, go back to our text in Colossians 1, and notice a third effort that we must make. We'll get to God's in just a moment, but one more in our area of responsibility. Notice, if you will, now verse 26, all right? Colossians 1 again, and look, if you will, at verse 26. Paul says this, even the mystery, notice that word, which hath been hid from ages and from generations, notice, but now is made manifest to his, notice this last word, saints, his saints. Number three, also, we need to exert effort in the area of community with other believers. We need to gather, we need to assemble, we need to be in the setting where God's people are, and that community of believers allows us to be more the Christian God wants us to be. Um, have you ever noticed the silly things that we allow to divide us? I'm not just talking about in the church setting. I'm talking just in general. I saw the other day a picture, and it was a, a must have been out west somewhere, but it had speed limit 85. I don't know if 85 is even legal in the U.S. anywhere. Maybe it was just a spoof, but it was a speed limit sign. It said speed limit 85. It was like a white road sign off the side of the road. And underneath it said this. Uh, it said, uh, Chevys, just do the best you can. <laughs> I don't know, some of you aren't laughing, you're giving me deaf looks, maybe you're a Chevy guy. Uh, I don't know if the type of pickup you drive, if that offends you or not, if someone else is not driving the same model that you would prefer or you think is amazing. Um, but, but I'm amazed in church how often we let divisiveness creep in. And it keeps us from the together growth and fellowship that we need. I haven't seen any of you keying Chevys out in our parking lot recently. But I've noticed that we often allow differences to divide us. Who's behind keeping believers from gathering together? Yeah, not the Lord, is it? It's the divider. It's the accuser of the brethren. It's that which is seeking to divide and conquer us. And so God wants us to gather and share in community with one another. Now, very quickly, notice verse 26. I emphasize when we read it. Notice it says, even the mystery. All right, what was a mystery has now been revealed, notice, through the saints. I want to give you another example of where that occurs in Scripture. Go back, if you will, very quickly to uh, 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy, if you will, chapter 3 and verse 15. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. And it's interesting to me that the word mystery and, and the term of church or saints often occurs within the same verse. And it's interesting, I think, why that is the case. Look, if you will, at 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. And this would reinforce why we need to gather together, why we need community with believers. 1 Timothy 3, look at verse 15. Paul says this, But if I tarry long, Timothy, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, notice which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. We've studied this verse in times past. Now notice verse 16. And without controversy, great is the, notice the next word, mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. And here's my point this morning. Wherever there is mystery, God brings His people, God brings the church 
to reveal what to that point has been a mystery. Have you ever had an aha moment when you're with God's people? I found sometimes for you, it, when we're in a setting where you're sharing your testimony or what God has taught you, just because it's your personality and you've been in your Bible and the Holy Spirit's been working in you, there's an angle, there's a perspective I've never thought of before. Uh, and, and it teaches me, reveals something to me. And so God uses those different people communing together, fellowshipping together to grow us as believers. And I believe God's greatest greenhouse for growing Christians is the local church. I believe that. I'm here today because I want to grow. I want to learn something today from you. I want to learn something through you, from God. I want to learn something through His Word and through His Spirit. And so communing together, being with God's people, Hebrews 10, verse 24 says, we're to consider one another. We're to uh, make decisions based upon the benefit of another person. Notice, to provoke and to love and what? Good works. Doing our works, doing our effort. The best way to do good works is to be encouraged with other believers. Keep going, keep doing, keep being. And we encourage one another in that effort. And I will tell you this this morning. Every time you find a growing Christian you'll find a person who is directly in contact with a local church. He's with a community. She is with a community of believers. And they're encouraging each other. They're challenging each other. They're teaching each other. It's the isolated believer that gets discouraged. It's the isolated believer that becomes stagnant in their faith and in their walk with God. You being here today, I'm thankful you're here today. I need you here. Others need you here. You need to be here so that we might be the believer God would have us to be. Now, one more verse and we'll move on. Would you go back to 1 Corinthians again, chapter 15, and look at verse 58. And this would close out our thought in the area of our effort. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and if you would please, verse 58. I know you know this verse, but look at it if you will, most of you. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58. The Bible says this, on the heels of all the great truths of Christ's resurrection and the victory we have in Him, Notice what he says in verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, be ye steadfast, unmovable. Notice these next words, always abounding in the what? Work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain. Now, I want you to notice two little pronouns. That pronouns, I'm thankful that in this translation of the Bible that we have that tell us it's plural. Look at it. It says, be ye, that's plural you, second person, you guys, you all wherever you're from, and y'all, all all right? That's who he's talking to. Notice the end of the verse, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain. There's something about us together reminding ourselves what we're doing is worth it, what we're doing is significant, what we're doing is of eternal value. The ye part of our relationship with God. And when you and I are faithful to our local community of believers, I believe we're in the place Jesus would be if he were here. Where we're following in his footsteps. Christ gathered with his people we would be wise to follow suit. I saw a little card the other day that had this statement on it that I think is relevant in this area of effort. It said this, quote, God gives every bird its food, but he doesn't throw it into the nest. God gives every bird its food, but he does not throw it into the nest. There's still effort. And dearly beloved today, I think if you're honest with the Lord, it's not on God because you're not the Christian you should be today. It's on you today. It's on me today. May we take seriously the effort we must exert so that God may make us the believer He wants us to be. Now, if you will, secondly, go back to our text in Colossians 1. And notice a second aspect of effort that is, to me, the most exciting part of this passage, all right? So we picked on each other for a few minutes here about what we need to do, all right? Hopefully you've been challenged by that. But now let me encourage you by looking at the last portion of verse 29. Colossians 1 again, look if you will at the end of verse 29. Paul says this, whereunto I'll, (coughs) excuse me, also labor, striving according, notice this now, to his working, notice, which worketh in me mightily. Number two, also we need to experience God's powerful effort. God's powerful effort. Several years ago, the uh, AP Press put together a study. And in that study, they were, it was done out in the state of Iowa, they did a study that was uh, determining uh, how much went into producing 
a hundred bush, uh, bushels of corn from one acre of land. Like what energy, what outside sources exerted upon that land would produce that corn? And they determined based upon averages and studies that an average acre of land that would produce that much corn would require four uh, million pounds of water, 6,800 pounds of oxygen, 5,200 pounds of carbon, 160 pounds of nitrogen, 125 pounds of potassium, 75 pounds of yellow sulfur, and a multitude of other smaller components that would uh, exert upon that land to produce that crop. After doing all of that testing, and then of course adding to that other things just that the climate provides, the soil nutrients provide to that product, they estimated that of the percentages, only 5% of what energy it took to produce that corn was given by the farmer. 5%. And can I tell you, I would say the proportion is probably even greater spiritually, but don't get confused with what we just talked about, that somehow those things we just talked about will just magically produce lasting eternal fruit and blessings. God has to be involved in our lives. We have to let Him into the landscape of our home and our heart and our mind and our workplace and our church if we're going to see fruit that abounds, fruit that remains. And so God's effort has to be a part of our lives. And Paul is careful. Did you notice that in verse 29? After he talks about how he's striving, he then says, hold on, but the mightily part, that's what God's doing. It is His strength, it is His might that is ultimately working in through my ministry. And I found, I just had one again last night, a lot of times I have less than full sleep on Saturday nights. And some of you maybe had it for different reasons. Some of our men came in very late last night to turn the building around for today. But often my mind as I lay down, I'm thinking about what needs done tomorrow at church, prayer, people God's laid in my heart, needs that are represented. And I found about the only way that I can let that go is just say, God, you're going to have to work in this heart. You're going to have to work in this situation. You're going to have to meet with us tomorrow and do what only you can. I, I can't pull this off today. Can you? This week, the things you have on your plate and on your schedule, you need God in that. I need God in that. I want, listen, I want to see God work in ways that can't be explained other than God worked. He did this. He, he intervened. He provided. And our church and our families and our walk with God needs to experience God's powerful effort. If I were to ask you today, when's the last time God did something in your life? I hope it's before, it's after you get up this morning. At the most, it was yesterday evening that you saw God do something. We're missing the effort of God, His power, His presence, and as a result, we're less than the Christians God would have us to be. Now, how do we get there? How do we experience the power that only God can bring? Look, if you will, back at verse 24. And this is key. Three ways in which we can experience more of God's power forever. Look at verse 24. Paul says, "...who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for His body's sake, which is the church. Number one, first of all, if we're to experience God's powerful effort, we must be consistent in problems. We must be consistent in problems. Jesus Christ, His earthly ministry, was it more characterized by comfort or at least inconvenience? He had no place to pillow His head. He, even in His best day was a downer. Even His most glorious moments were tainted with the cross, the shadow of the cross, and His life was one of sorrows. He was acquainted with grief. And yet we think Christianity is all about just being happy and having life just click and work out. What about when it doesn't? Do we maintain consistent faith and tenacious commitment to Jesus Christ in the midst of problems? In Luke 9 and verse 51, it describes Christ. It says, And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face toward Jerusalem. He was committed. He was going to finish what God had given him to do. And here in verse 24, Paul is not saying that somehow he is adding to or he's making up the difference of Christ's suffering on the cross. He's talking about now that Christ has resurrected, he's suffering for the benefit of God's people. He's suffering in service and sacrifice for them. My boy Landon is in uh, first grade here at uh, Worcester Christian in town. And he was telling me the other day, or second grade, sorry, he's in second grade. Um, time flies. He was telling me that he has a classmate and it, you, you had to hear him tell the story. If you ever talk to my son, Lane, and ask him about, Micah would know about this too, ask him about his classmate who has a water bottle issue. 
The issue is this, this dear little girl, now last year this happened and now this year already it's happened, I think twice, she has a water bottle and somehow the nozzle of this water bottle, she'll start sucking on it and her lip will get stuck in that water bottle. And the loving parents, they keep sending her with this water bottle and Landon's like, I don't get it. She'll walk to the office with this thing hanging from her lip again, you know, it's like this, this big crisis, you know, and she's got this problem and it's, oh no, she's got the water bottle thing going again. It's her problem. And they, they it just, to hear as a second grader, him processing that, what's the deal with that? Do you ever, do you ever have water bottle moments, you know? You're just trying to get through life and do what you're supposed to and then something comes, just minor even, inconveniences. To be a Christian, we must be consistent in the midst of problems, in the midst of challenges. Romans 8, 28, a verse we know well, but it reminds us of the sovereignty of God and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. And I found for a Christian, we need to believe God's in control. Do you believe that today? The things that drive you nuts, the things that are glorious in your life this morning, do you realize God's in control of that? He's moving and He's working. See, Christians believe that. And if you're a believer this morning, may you by faith trust God is working out His will in and through your life. Will you choose to respond to crisis with faith and with hope that God will work things out for His will and for His glory? So we need consistency in problems. Where do we get God's power? We get it in dark moments, don't we? It's perfected, it's refined, it's revealed in our problematic moments. All right, number two, if you will now, look at verse 27 here in Colossians 1. He goes on to say this, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of His mystery, notice, among the Gentiles, notice that at the end of this verse, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Number two, also, we need communion with Jesus. If we're to experience God's powerful effort in our lives, we must be in close relationship with Jesus Christ. The other day I saw a sign along the side of the road. It was a sign for a, they were selling a parachute. And on the sign it had the following words. On the first line it said this, for sale. Line two it said parachute. Line three, only used once. And the last line, never opened. Uh, no thank you, all right? Never open, all right? Use once, but never open. I, I think I would prefer not to buy it from that guy that used it, uh, but never opened it. Do you know when it comes to Jesus Christ, He is a sure thing. Uh, he's worth knowing. He's worth trusting with your life today. He's worth trusting with your future. And Christians do that. How often do we take back control? We try to crisis manage our life and we try to direct it and steer it in our own effort and our own ability. Back in Ephesians 2, it describes us as a people without hope and without God. And yet here, because Christ is in us, we have the hope of glory. Man, great things are coming. And we anticipate that and we live in light of the promises God has given. I ask you this morning, listen to me. Do you have one-on-one -on -one time with Jesus? I'm amazed how many Christians really don't even know what the name Jesus means. They don't know what Jesus can be in their life. They, they don't hear Him speak to them. They don't follow Him. They don't identify with Him publicly. He's just kind of a side note. My wife, when I say I know my wife and she knows me, that's a decision that we have made to know one another. And I think oftentimes in our relationship with family, we put more effort in. We spend more time and concentrated uh, pursuit of that person, but with Jesus Christ, we just hope it happens. Spending time with Him, listening to Him, talking to Him, letting Him move in us in those intimate times of fellowship. How's your walk with Jesus this morning? Do you know Him? Do you hear from Him? Do you talk to Him in a way that pleases the Lord? Do you remember in Acts chapter 4, you have these unlearned fishermen, and Christ is died, buried, resurrected, now he's gone, and now they're the first church, they're representing Jesus Christ, and they start talking, and in verse number 13, it says this of these ignorant fishermen, the crowd looked at them, it says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, notice the end of the verse, and took knowledge of them, what? That they had been with Jesus. I know when I'm around you when you've been with Jesus. And probably if you're honest this morning, you know when that's true of me and when it's not. 
Does the world know we've been with Jesus? Do believers know we've been with Jesus? Do our kids, do our spouses, do people around us sense that we've spent time with Jesus? A Christian has communion with him. Now lastly, let's spend a few minutes here in verse 28 and we'll be done. Look at verse 28. There's a third commitment that we must make if we're to experience God's working in our lives. First of all, we need to have consistency in problems. Number two, communion with Jesus. And notice now verse 28, whom we preach, notice, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, notice that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Thirdly, we need commitment in the area of endurance. We need commitment in the area of endurance. Notice the endurance of Paul. We preach, we warn, we teach in all wisdom. Present every man perfect or complete in Christ Jesus. The other day I had the uh, privilege uh, to have breakfast with a couple of men, a couple of men in our church, as well as another man that joined us for breakfast. We were talking through some things, getting some counsel. And the, the basic breakfast was me and another guy who was about my age were two of the group. And then the other two men were, would be about my dad's age, all right? Um, baby boomer era. Um, so it was two young guys and two middle-aged guys. I consider myself still young. And uh, we were sitting there at breakfast. And what was interesting, so that tells you what I think of you if you're older than me. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, kind of is that we were sitting there, is how we ordered our breakfast. It was just an interesting little thing. I didn't even think about it in the moment. But me and the other guy, they're about my age. You know, we think a lot alike as far as generationally. And uh, I ordered kind of a prefab menu meal. I'll take this meal. It had a name or a number or something. And then he did the same thing. But what was interesting is these two middle-aged guys, they said, I'll have some hash browns, a couple eggs with cheats on it. You know, they just a la carte just ordered what they wanted. They didn't care. I don't care what kind of meals you put together. Give me what I want. And, and they ordered it a la carte. And it was just interesting to me, the generational difference. For me, it's just easier. Just give me a number three. If there's something on I don't like, it's all right. I'll pick around and eat the rest. For them, it was why waste your money or time on something that you don't want. So just give me this and this and this. You ever notice the generational gaps uh, some of you don't get me real well sometimes because I'm younger or older than you and vice versa. You know, there are sometimes differences. You know what I believe one of the greatest generational gaps between the first century believer and our generation of believers? We, unlike those that have gone before us, we lack patience. We lack patience. And because it takes a little while, we move on from being a Christian to being whatever else we have to be to get what we want right now. The early believers knew how to wait, generally speaking. Believers today, generally speaking, we do not know how to wait. And because we don't know how to wait, we stop, listen to me, working. That's hard for me to do. Work doing what I'm supposed to do while I wait on God to do what He's supposed to do. And Paul said, I just keep going. I, I want every man perfect. I want everything accomplished, but I can't do all that. I'm just going to be faithful with my part, and God will in His time and in His way bless that endurance. Our heart is a field. God is the gardener. It takes time to nurture and grow and develop fruit. And if daily we'll stay faithful to God, God will produce what He desires in His time and in His way. Now, if you will, go quickly back to the book of Hebrews. I think we have time to look at this as we begin to wrap up today. Hebrews chapter 13, and if you will, verse number 10. I'm sorry. Hebrews 10 and verse 35. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 35. And I want you to notice the spirit of endurance, the spirit of commitment that's found in these verses. Hebrews chapter number 10 and verse 35. The writer of, he, writer of Hebrews says this, Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. Notice this next phrase. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have, after, notice that, after ye have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come, will come, and will not tarry. Now I want you to notice verse Number 36, again, he says, you have need of patience. Why? Because after you've done the will of God, you receive the promise. Not before you do the will of God, not while you're doing the will of God, after, after. And I believe to experience everything God wants us to experience, we need greater endurance. Greater endurance to yield to God 
greater endurance to anticipate what God is going to do, and greater resting, waiting upon God to prove himself in his time and in his way. Yesterday in the news, there was an article about a comic book that just sold this past week. Um, It was a rare and almost flawless copy of the very first comic book ever printed for Superman. Um, I don't know if you know this or not, but two guys living in Cleveland here in Ohio were the ones that, that got that whole idea of Superman going. I didn't realize it until just this past week in reading. And it was a first edition. It was the very first comic that portrayed graphically who Superman, what he looked like. You know, his great looking outfit. That's what I always thought as a kid. Nice outfit, buddy. I'd never wear that. But anyway, it showed what he looked like, the colors, the style. the And, and that has become the foundation of what we Uh, in our minds have when we refer to the term Superman. What was interesting about the story was this, that that comic, I mean, it old, sold for $3.2 million. It is the most expensive uh, purchase ever made for a comic book. And it was interesting, they were interviewing the two, two gentlemen that bought this through an eBay online auction. And they said this, the one gentleman said this, it's hard to believe that a kid's 10 cent comic book could be worth that much money. And he's the guy who just bought it. Can I ask you a question today? Do you realize what an all-powerful God can do with something that's worth 10 cents in and of itself when his supernatural ability gets involved in the process? Have you seen God work in people's lives in ways that just blows your mind? Have you seen him work in your life that way? Do you want to see more of that? Do you want to experience more of that? Can I just give you a couple things that are found in Paul's life and ministry that should be true of us? Number one, we need to exert personal effort. Where's your effort today? Are you prepared and primed to be in church today and hear from God? Are you ready? You ready for what he's going to do next? This week, are you going to be prepared for God to move in and to invade and to move in your life as only he can? Am I willing to do that? And number two, when he begins to work, am I willing to let there be some difficulty with that? The pain of that? The struggle of that, the waiting of that, so that God might bring into our lives everything that he desires. Now, I want you to look at one last verse. Go to Philippians, if you would, chapter 2. And I want you to look at a couple of verses that give us this tension, if you will, between our effort and God's effort. Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 12. See, Paul labored and Paul worked, but he also knew that God had to do his work. And I hope today that God will help you understand that balance and that tension and as a result, you'll become more the Christian that the Lord wants you to be. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12. <laughs> the Bible says this, Wherefore, Philippians 2, 12, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Notice the end of this verse. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. All right? There's our effort. Now notice verse 13. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Did you catch that balance there? We work out our own salvation, not we work for it, not we work to keep it. We work out what's already begun in our hearts. It becomes real, it becomes relevant, it becomes practical. And number two, as we do that, notice what God does. He works in us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. You want to you know what I want for your life? I don't want, I don't want you to think I, that I have to be happy with you. I don't want my kids, I don't want our church members, I don't want those in our community to say, hey, I brought a smile to the preacher's face or someone else in that church. You want to know what I want? I want God to be pleased with your life. I want God to smile when he thinks of where your heart is and your mind is and your priorities are and what his power can do with that. As we finish this morning, not just this study, but our series Can I lovingly but directly tell you, stop with the laziness. Stop with a half-hearted effort at being a Christian. Put in the effort. Let God infuse His power into your life. See, I think when that's true, we will see people saved in our life. We'll see things change in our life. We'll see things grow in our life. It'll be, I, I don't even know where to begin to tell you all God's doing in my life. Why is that not true of me today? Why is often that not true of you? I think it comes back to a little word called effort. It's not about our intelligence. It's not about even opportunities. It's about effort aligning with God's will and God's plan. Let's pray. Father, thank you today for your...